Well, good morning, Forefront. I'm Reverend Josh Raderly. I serve as one of the co-pastors here uh, of community and teaching, and I just want to say thank you for coming out on this rainy day. Um, hopefully you've been reminded of your baptisms and have been refreshed <laughs> as, as, you, as you came out. I uh, hope that th today um, you would feel just as refreshed by this message. I'll see what I did there. <clears throat> we are in the last week of our series on the sacraments, and uh, we're talking about communion this week. And... You know, I think when you, when you talk about communion, a lot of different things come up. One of the first stories that came to mind for me was when I was in elementary school. Uh, as shared before, I was never good at sports. I was never good at the arts. Um, and I always really, really wanted to fit in with the other boys. And so elementary school, like, I would try so hard to play kickball, play basketball, play um, football out with the guys at recess, and it just never worked. And, I was, and once they did the, the team picking, like, I was always the last... <laughs> Or not at all. Like, they were like odd numbers. Like, sorry, you, you can't be on a team because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't level out. And so I would just like sit and watch. It was just really sad, right? And so my grandmother would, she, she decided, now I show you this picture because my grandmother decided for that the solution to this was to buy me a referee shirt. <laughs> now, I didn't have pigtails, but that would have really added to it if I did. <laughs> I think I would have really completed this whole outfit. Um, but she bought me, she bought me this referee shirt and a whistle and a little rule book. And she said, this is the way that you're going to be able to still hang with the boys. And she's like, you're good at being bossy and telling people what to do. <laughs> so, like, this will be your in. And so I, like, read this referee book and I studied it and tried to understand what the heck was happening in these games. And, and that was my in. The guys loved it. Like, they loved that there was someone to sort of, like, keep order and make it feel a little bit more real and authentic. And that was my in with sports. Honestly, I don't really know what I was doing. I don't remember. I didn't retain or remember much of it. I could tell you two teams in all of sports at this point, the Cubs and the Bears. I couldn't even tell you. I think there was, like, Yankees here, right? Something like that. We went to a game. What was it about? What was the game we went to? What, Mets? It was the Mets. It was the Mets <laughs> playing the Cubs. We won tickets at the gala here uh, last year. It's the only reason I would have went, because I got a deal, and it helped Forefront. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 when I think about that, that element of, like, uh, of playing and wanting to be included, I, I can't help but think about how many of us also experience communion in the church. This thing that everyone's participating in, but yet there's these levels of expectation of, like, who's in and who's out. Like, who's good enough and who's not good enough to participate in this act that the whole community is doing. And there's a sort of like, well, you're holy, and no, you're holy, you're not holy. And the, here are the people who are super holy enough to like bless the sacraments and to serve the communion. And here are the people who can receive it. And here's the way you have to have your life. Maybe some of you have gone to Catholic uh, weddings or something. And if you're not Catholic, you have to do this when you go up for communion or not go up at all because if you're not Catholic, they won't serve you communion. Um, or maybe in the evangelical tradition, you grew up in a place where they said if you eat and drink um, communion without having confessed your sin and, or stopped your sin in your life, that you're eating and drinking death upon yourselves, quoting Corinthians. And so it created this fear of like, well, am I worthy enough? Am I good enough? Can I go up and can I take this? Can I be included? Well, what I want to remind us of this today is that Jesus never intended for communion to invoke feelings of isolation, feelings of shame, to be picked last or to be told that you don't belong at all on the team. If Jesus had thought that all along, that when Jesus had the very first communion, then he would have said, Judas, you are a little betrayer. <laughs> Take your little jerk self out of this room and go do your thing before I serve. No, he didn't. He served him first. Served Thomas, served Peter, served all of those in the room, knowing what they would do, knowing their mistakes, knowing their past, knowing their present, knowing their future. He served them all. Because it wasn't about who was in and who was out. It was about who was loved. Bishop Michael Curry said, Communion is a sacrament of unity that overcomes even the deepest estrangements between human beings. This sacrament, it was always meant to be subversive. I'm going to explain to you what I think by that. In that it found a place for everyone on the team. Leaving no one estranged and no one as an undesirable team pick. Yet, unfortunately, as we're going to look at today throughout church history, communion has been used instead as a tool to determine who's in and who's out. Who's on the team and who's not on the team. Who you can trust and who's good and who's not trustworthy and not good. But that's never what I think Jesus intended. But really quickly before we dig into that, let's just talk about like the nuances of this tradition. 
So there's a lot of different terms for communion, depending on the tradition you grew up in. Some people refer to communion as Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper, Mass, Agape Feast, Breaking Bread. Anything else that I've missed that you all grew up with? No? There's probably something that I don't know. But all these different traditions um, have different names and different backgrounds. Throughout this series, we've, we've used a couple different words that maybe you haven't been super familiar with and some of you have had questions about. And so I just really quickly wanted to define these three different traditions within Christianity and when they came about and what they are. Um, so there's Roman Catholic that was completely formed in 509 AD, so about 500 years after Jesus died. The Roman Catholic Church finally formed in its wholeness. Interesting that they call it Roman, right? Because it was, it was literally... Uh, the Roman government establishing a religion, okay? So Roman Catholic. So all of a sudden, this is religion, the, the religion and the state getting in bed together, Roman Catholic. And then in 1517, this is when you have pr a Protestantism begin. And Protestantism is when you've heard me, heard me refer to mainline Protestants. Mainline Protestants are people who you can trace back the history basically to the very first couple hundred years of when they broke off from Catholicism. These are places like Methodists, the Presbyterians, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Anglicans, uh, Congregationalists, some Baptist streams. These are people who, who have a long history all the way back to the beginning of Protestantism. But then you have other references that we've said throughout the series, which are evangelicals. Or maybe you've heard non-denominational churches. These have only been around since the 19th century. These are places like Pentecostal, Holiness Movement, um, Southern Baptist. These are fairly new movements within the Christian denominations or traditions. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the evolution of how these came uh, and where they came from. Because we've used these terms sort of like uh, uh, very flippantly during the series. And I've realized we maybe should have defined those a little earlier. But maybe these are helpful as you think through um, this series as well as moving forward, as well as um, how, we, how we all take communion in many different experiences based on your many different traditions and also based on the different churches. So for me, I know growing up in the Islamists of God, we only took communion once a month. In the Baptist church, once a quarter. In the non-denominational church, whenever it was relevant to the sermon. <laughs> Uh, in the Independent Christian Church, we took it every week. In the United Methodist Church, we took it every week. In the United Church of Christ, we took it once a month. In the, in, in the last interdenominational church that I was a part of, we took it once a month. Here at Forefront, we take it every week. Why do we take it every week here? It's because we started in a tradition called the Orchard Group, which is the, the Christian Church or the Independent Church of Christ. And in the Church of Christ, that tradition takes it every single Sunday. Now, we got kicked out of that group because we were affirming, and so we're no longer connected to them. But that is on our history, is that we took it every week because that tradition, the Church of Christ, takes it every week. So this is kind of why we still do this. Um, but I don't think we need to always hold fast to that. But I think it's a be beautiful thing because it sort of allows uh, there to be diversity. Because if, say, you grew up in a tradition where you only want to take it once a month, then guess what? You can just stay in your seat. You don't have to take it every week. No one's forcing you, right? You want to take it once a quarter? Okay, you get to decide once a quarter. But if you offer it every week, then it's also available to those who grew up in that tradition. So there's some versatility there in that how you feel comfortable with taking it. Who can serve communion? Well, historically, men. <laughs> Historically, then, also ordained men. And eventually, uh, in certain traditions, ordained men and women. Um, eventually, some traditions develop, particularly within evangelicalism, that allow just like church leaders or deacons to serve. Uh, this has been policed in many different ways. And I would say here at Forefront, one of the beautiful things that we believe is that, like, we don't think that, like, only the elements that are up in front of us you can take, right? Like, whatever you have, whatever juice or substance you have, particularly for our virtual folks at home, like, it is sufficient. It is not about the actual elements as much as it's about what the elements remind and invoke in us. And it's not about who serves it or, or, or christens it or prays over it or blesses it and makes it holy. It's not about that for us here. Uh, within this tradition, but that is true for other traditions, and we, we can talk more about that. So what does communion mean? Eucharist, it means Eucharist in, in, in Greek, which means a good gift, but it also can be translated as thanksgiving. So in essence, it has something to do with a gift being shared with others, um, a gift being shared with others, with one another. This is sort of what this traces back to us throughout history. But more than that, um, it, it, it's, it's interesting that communion comes to us actually as like a reformed tradition from Judaism. So at Passover every year, there would basically, folks gather, and this is still a tradition that's embraced by Jews. As they gather for Passover, they would have a meal. For this meal, they would wash their hands in a basin of water, and then after they've washed their hands in a basin of water, they would then break bread. 
They'd be disperse it across the table. And then they would drink together, uh, usually some type of wine, right? This is why we have wine often for communion. They would drink some type of wine. This is my uh, chalice from my, our, our wedding uh, as we prepare to celebrate our, our one-year anniversary next month. <laughs> Shameless little plug in there. Just slip that in there. Um, and, then they, they would, and then they would gather a plate of lamb, and they would eat the lamb together. And then the children would have this little fun ac- activity they would look for a piece of bread that was broken called the afikomen. And today, the afikomen is underneath somebody's chair. And I want you to, everyone to look and see, like, like they would do in a Jewish tradition, where is it hidden? Who has it? And it's wrapped in, it's wrapped in some type of paper. Uh, and it's, oh, it's really hot over here. <laughs> it's really hot over here. It's just, yes, they are, there it is. You found the Afi Komen, and you get to eat that. You can have that. It's wrapped. It's for you. Uh, but the Afi Komen was a piece of bread that they would break, wrap it in a cloth as you have over there, and they would hide it, and then the children would look for it. And when they found the bread, then they would take it, and they would disperse it, and they would eat it. Now, the Afi Komen is interesting because uh, this, is a, this is an image, an idea of what, what, what it would look like. It's interesting because Christians uh, would then interpret this to mean this. This was the Messiah. Uh, As Jews would gather, they would hide the Messiah somewhere during Passover in the room with the belief that one day the Messiah would reveal itself as it was hidden. It would come forth into the world, and we would then see freedom and and reconciliation, and it would take what was broken and would make it whole again, which is why they eat it, and it it creates a, a symbol of wholeness on an empty stomach. Okay? So Christians then later interpret this during the Passover since Jesus, when he gathers with the disciples, it's believed that he would have taken the afikomen and he would have said, this is me. I am the Messiah. I am the bread. I am the, bro- I am the broken body. I will go to the cross now. I will die. And I am the thing that has been hidden. I will be hidden for three days and then I will be uncovered and I, you will find me again. I will rise. Okay? And so this is why Christians begin to interpret the Passover in this way and interpret communion and its connections to that because of what Jesus did in the Last Supper. Does that make sense? Yes. So this is kind of where we get that from in that religious tradition, adopting it from, from Judaism. The other thing you'll notice about that bread is really flat, right? It's really flat because it has no yeast in it. And there's no yeast in it because yeast is a symbol of sin. And so it's to say that the Messiah would be sinless, and Jesus then, of course, has made the comparison to also be then what? Sinless. And so this is why the, the, the bread does not rise, and it's just a flat piece of, of bread that looks more like a cracker. So uh, there's some connections there. Now, when, when, when communion first begins within Christianity and they start doing it, people, are, people who are not Christians and have not converted are com- completely confused by this. Right? I mean, as they would be. Uh, they basically are like, wait, are these Christians cannibals? Like, they're eating people's blood and body? Like, what's happening here? Wait, and then they begin to wonder, are they, is there human sacrifice happening? You know, you can imagine, you can imagine the chatter amongst town as people are trying to understand what this is and what this means. It created a lot of tension. It actually created quite a disincentive for people to follow Christ and, and to convert to Christianity. Rightfully so. I think sometimes it still does that today, right? The idea of somebody coming to be a part of our faith, and we're talking about, like, hey, we're eating this, this, this juice and this bread, this symbol, like someone's body and blood, we're consuming it. Right? feels very ancient. feels like a very odd practice uh, on the other side of 2,000 years. Yet there's, this, there's, there's a reality, I think, that it, it, can be, it can pause and it can remind us of the journey of, of our faith and how it's progressed over time. That for most of human history, the idea was focused on human sacrifice or on animal sacrifice to make people right with God. And to remind us that we have taken a long journey that not even the Jewish community does that anymore. They, too, have had to evolve in how they understand uh, sacrifice and reconciliation and understanding with God. In the Jewish community, realizing reconciliation with God looks like making things right between you and the person you've hurt or you and creation and the harm that you've caused, not necessarily killing an animal and everything is right. And so we've all evolved in our understanding of this. And so I think communion sometimes, it's, it's a good reminder to us of the progressive journey of our faith and, and to not just disregard and forget the journey of our ancestors and, 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 how they've, and how they've struggled to understand God and the reconciliation process. So really quickly, um, I want to I wanna highlight kind of our, some of the history of communion and how it's evolved over time to, to where we are today in many of our Christian traditions. 
Um, there's a lot here, and so I'm actually going to kind of go through this quickly. Uh, surprise, surprise. But uh, we'll just start here. Ignatius of Antioch in the early church, they believed that communion was like a medicine for immortality. So you take it. If you receive communion, it means that you have eternal life. You'll live forever. Uh, as basically an antidote to not die. In the Didache, which is basically a bunch of, or Didache, it is a bunch of early Christian writings, and it basically said the only communion they decided in the early church was for the baptized. So if you weren't baptized, you couldn't receive communion. And then Justin Martyr in the second century, um, that this is when liturgy is first began to be used around communion. So basically people would pray and read sort of certain rituals, and it would be over a meal. People would gather for food, for a dinner together, and this is begin how communion would happen in someone's home. It would be a scripture, some songs, uh, the kiss, a, a kiss on one another's cheeks as an ex- exchange of love. And you'd be grateful that we don't do that. Instead, we do a meet and greet. It's much you know, less intense uh, for our community. And, and so you kind of have these, these motions, and then they share communion together. In the 2nd and 5th century, they begin to believe that actually the real presence of Jesus is in the bread. And so when the pastors pray or the bishops pray over the bread, that it actually becomes the real presence of Jesus. And so this sort of idea gets, gets introduced, and it's the idea that God is with us is why they're thinking about this. Uh, in the 3rd and 4th century, Emperor Constantine, again, remember, this is when the Roman Empire and Christianity begin to become one. This all of a sudden, it's all, everything changed because now people weren't gathering in homes for communion. They were building huge cathedrals. They were building huge buildings. All of a sudden, churches started to be constructed. And so it was no longer a meal gathered around a table like a Passover Seder. Instead, it was you come forward in these large cathedrals and you were served communion by the church in an official capacity. And the Roman government, in step with the Christian church, determined who was in good standing and who wasn't and who would receive and who wouldn't receive. And so all of a sudden, the policing becomes stronger. In 324, it's decided that only priests can administer communion. So you're not allowed, nobody could just serve communion in their own homes, not allowed anymore. And then in the medieval times, Middle Ages, obviously things got very scarce, lots of diseases are going around, food is, food is sparse, they only take communion once a year because they don't want to begin to spread too much and um, it's just very expensive. So this is the history of communion. Interesting, yes? And then you have, when Protestantism starts, you have a little bit of other ships. Martin Luther, he believes that communion is both Um, both an element of mystery and the body of God. But then John Calvin believes that God is present both spiritually and not literally. And then in the 15th century, it's believed that that communion is just symbolic. It's 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 not any literal sense of God. God's not in the juice or in the bread. It's just a symbolic remembrance of Jesus. And so it's actually kind of interesting to think that that that's actually a fairly new thought in Christian history. So you see where we're at. And this is what most uh, evangelical or post-evangelical Protestants believe, that it's just sort of a memorial uh, and remembrance. So moving forward here, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen says this, and I think this is really interesting for us to, to think about. What is the relevance to communion for us today? In the following instructions, it says, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is being done when you meet together. Paul is writing to the, the Corinthian church. He says, first, I hear that there are some divisions among you when you meet at church. And, some, and to some extent, I believe it. There's some shade there. There's some shade there from Paul. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. Verse 20, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. Mm, okay, come on, coming in hard, coming in hot. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing it with others. As a result... Some of you are going hungry while others are getting drunk. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to a party, show up a little, little, little late? And, and, and then they're like, where's the booze? You're like, oh, Robert over there. You know why he's passed out? He drank all the booze before everybody could get here. What? Verse 22 says, uh, don't, don't, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say to you? What do you want me to praise you for? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. Coming in hot, Paul. He's upset. He's ticked. Why? Because he's like, listen, those of you who don't work nine to fives and you have a a nice, comfortable privilege, you show up at church 
and you just eat all the food in this meal before everyone else can get here. And those who are working the 9 to 5 finally get off their job at 5 o'clock and make it to church to come to the communion meal together. And they get here, and guess what? Y'all who've been lounging and hanging out all day, you ate all the food and you drank all the drinks because you didn't think about those who actually had to work and had to come later, as Paul's referencing, the poor. There's no middle class. There's the rich and there's the poor. And he's saying, seriously, you're calling yourself Christians? You knew other people were coming later. And all you did was think about yourself at this meal. People are starving in the church. This might be their only meal of the day. And you ate it all. You drank it all. Because remember, it's not just like a little piece of bread and juice. This was a meal. This was a meal they were sharing together. Paul's ticked with them. He's picked, ticked by the, the, the fact that they're not thinking of one another. And more than that, I think he realizes that as long as they have divisions amongst each other, that there will always be indifference and inequity that they have created within this Christian community. And communion was always meant to be a subversive activity. What do I mean by that? Sometimes the most radical act we can do as Christians is to share a meal with someone different than us. This is exactly what Jesus was doing when he had the first communion. This is exactly what Jesus was inviting the early church to do. He was invite, And this is exactly what Jesus did all throughout his ministry, dining with people who others said, you shouldn't be dining with them. Talking to people he shouldn't be talking to. Because in the ancient world, men and men had meals together, not men and women. In the ancient world, those who were enslaved and those who were the enslavers, they didn't share a meal together. Those who were the poor and the rich, they didn't share a meal together. Those who were Jews and Gentiles, they didn't share. They didn't. But Jesus is saying here, Let's, guess what I'm calling you to, church? I am calling you to all have a meal together, to look past your divides, look past your differences, and to think about one another. He's, he's calling them to be subversive in their culture. And Paul is saying, you're not doing it very well. You're doing it really poorly. And I'm calling you to be subversive. I'm calling you to break down the social divides and to think about other people. It would have been fine. It would have been fine if Jesus had invited them to a meal, all of these sinners, to tell them how unworthy they were. But that's not why Jesus ever had a meal with these people. Jesus called them a friend. He was a friend of sinners. Not a friend to sinners, but sinners called them his friend. Their friend. One of the things I can remember early on in the church I was pastoring back in, oh, back in Kentucky, my last church I pastored before I made a shift in my worldviews, I would invite people. I, my goal was to have everyone in the church over to my home for dinner. A little over 100 people in the church, and I accomplished that. And I remember the board saying, when you have so-and-so over and so-and-so over, Find out what's going on here in their lives. Find out what's happening here. We're not really sure about this detail and that detail. And they basically wanted me to use these dinners as an opportunity to police people's sin and the rumors and things they've heard. And particularly they were wondering about the men in the church because they needed some new elders and they wanted to know if they were holy enough to be elders. And I remember there were many times when I gave in to that. When I did it. When I had those dinners with people and I used the trust that they had built with me to find out what sin they had in their life and to call them on the mat at dinner. And I look back at that time in my life and I think about the harm and the pain that I'm sure I caused people. Because I thought that that's what dinner was supposed to be. I thought that's why I was dining with the sinners. And I can look at that now on the other side of that back in 2015. And I can realize now that that was never why Jesus had called me to dine with anyone. I was called to just love them. I was called to be with them. And I was a hypocrite because I had my own sin in my own life. And I wouldn't dare tell anybody because I knew they would use it against me. I think that that is where the church has lost itself. That is where I lost myself, and I'm glad to have found myself again in Jesus. 
to realize that that was never what the table was for. That was never what the church was for. That was never the role of pastors to police people's actions and their right and their wrong and determine if they could be on the team or not, to determine if they were good enough or not, and to be able to open my eyes to realize that Jesus never told somebody when he dined with them at a table, when he dined with them in the streets, when he met them at a well, he, he never told them that they were good enough or not good enough. He told them the opposite. He told them they were loved. He told them they were beloved. He told them to come to the table. So church, Rachel Held Evans describes this so poetically. She says, according to church historians, the focus of these early communion services was not on Jesus' death, but rather on Jesus' friendship. His presence made palatable amongst his followers by the taste and the sounds and the smells he loved. May when you come to the communion table, may you taste, may you smell, may you experience the tangible love of God. May it be like when Thomas touched the wounds of Jesus. May you feel the body. May you taste the body. May you smell the body. And may you be reminded of Jesus' friendship and never-ending love to stand alongside you. May communion be a moment when you pause and you give thanks for all who've come to the table before and you remember those who've been turned away from the table and a call to go and to remind people that these tables are open and welcome to everyone. Why? Because Jesus says so. I don't have time to go into the last page of this sermon, so I'll make a blog about it or something. But I'll just end with this by this to say this. Jesus chose to allow his blood to be spilled out instead of spilling his enemy's blood. To me, when I come to the table, that is my reminder. That is my reminder that the world's way is to tell people certain that you're in and you're out. The world's way is to fight tooth for tooth, eye for eye, nail for nail, to give people back what they've given to you. But Jesus comes and says, no, I'm going to invite everyone to the table. And even those who come to arrest me, even those who come to hurt me and harm me, instead of spilling their blood, I will let them spill mine. For love transcends all of it. For in that, people will truly know love if I don't fight the way the world does, if I am subversive and I live in the world different than the way the world operates. So when you come to this table, may you be reminded of the one whose blood was spilled so others wouldn't have to be, the one who came to the table who said, I will not spill blood. And the blood that has been spilled in our country and in our world through the Roman Empire, through the British Empire, through the American Empire, in the name of God, that's not in the name of God. Because if our God believed in sp- if our God believed in shedding blood in the name of God, he would have done it before the cross. And it wouldn't have been his blood shed. But he doesn't. Because he called us to be a subversive people who live a different way. And this table, every time we come to it, it's a reminder of that call to a subversive lifestyle. One that loves all people. And one that responds in a way that is different than how the world responds with division, divisiveness, and violence. Amen? Amen. As you come to the table today, you're going to receive communion from children. Uh, And they're going to say something very simple to you. And And they're going to remind you what communion is all about. And that is simply, they're going to say, Jesus loves you. And when you receive communion from children today, I want you... To receive it with this reality that for many, many, many centuries, children could never receive communion. Because it was believed that if they didn't understand it, how could they receive it? Well, I want to suggest to you this. How much more of a beautiful gift that when they grow old and they take communion and they're 12 or they're 13 and they begin to realize what Jesus means for them in their lives. That they look back and go, wow, I was experiencing the grace and love of God before I ever understood it. I was consuming and taking it and experiencing it, and I never even understood it. Isn't that all of our experiences? There are so many layers of God I don't know and I don't understand, but I experience it all the time. And there will come a day when I will sit on the other side of glory, and I'll go, wow, I experienced the grace and love of God in ways I never even knew and understood. Thank you, God, for that gift. So receive, receive the gift of communion this morning, knowing that you are loved from those who are loved.
We invite you to come. The bread is gluten-free. The juice is uh, juice in solidarity with those who are in recovery. Please take the elements and hold them, and we will take communion all together uh, a little bit later in this song here. So I invite you to stand, come forward now, and receive communion. Yay. Yay. Okay, can I get...